I married my wife Winter, went to college together in Philadelphia, Drexel University, and really married two weeks after college. We prayed about it and just felt like God was moving us to Texas. I had worked for about seven years, and I was in a place where I, where I felt like God was calling me to something new, and my, and my wife kept saying she felt like there was change coming. A friend that went to the church uh, basically introduced me uh, to, to Pastor Darren, and you know, God just kind of meshed together two stories and never applied for any jobs. But what was becoming evident to me is the gifts that God had given me were kind of lining up with what Pastor Darren was looking for. We came out for a visit in December and uh, came out for a few visits after that. And each one, um, it became more and more clear that this was just a special place uh, and that God wanted to do something special in my family. Little did I know, it'd look a whole lot different than what I thought. We literally closed on our house in Dallas on July 6th, which was a Friday, turned around and closed on our house here on July 9th. We moved in, we were able to just, you know, spend the night in our home and started getting our furniture out a little bit. And then we would leave for vacation for about two weeks, one week in Iowa with my family and then a week back in Dallas. On that Tuesday afternoon, um, I basically uh, came home from work and uh, I went to get dinner ready and she went to lay down. I asked her if she wanted dinner and she said, no, I think I just need to rest, I don't feel good. Literally walked into the bedroom after dinner and my wife had a cardiac event in front of me. It's a pretty traumatic experience, and um, my wife died in my arms. When we lost Winter, I tried to be like the spiritual dad that says, well, we need to pray about what God's plan is, and take our time, do we stay in Dallas, do we move to Nashville? And I remember sitting down with my oldest daughter and just having a conversation with her. And uh, Alina saying to me, she said, Mommy was more excited about Nashville and about Church of the City than any of us. Like, I knew that she would want us to go. God just started to show me that his plan wasn't about me getting here first and foremost to be a contributor to Church of the City, but to be a receiver of, um, of healing and of rest through a church family that I didn't even know. Pulling into the neighborhood um, and seeing all these people surrounding our home, cheering us on. I mean, I just broke out in tears. I have never in my life experienced just the love of a church like I have with this. Just the passion of the people uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's allowed me to just focus on loving my girls well through this process and just remembering my wife, memorializing my wife, and just taking the time uh, just to grieve. It's been a tremendous blessing. Knowing that God and his providence allowed Winter to, you know, not only buy this house, but experience being here. And it's like she signed off on every little thing from the church to the house, to the school, to, you know, our whole life. It reminds me that our God is intentional. God knew we had a new adventure, a new story that would unfold and brought us to a new place to start that and I'm excited to be a part of it. Well, good morning to you guys. It's good to be with you today. The, the church just gets keeping full, getting fuller and fuller the more we get into the day here, but I'm glad to be with you guys today, and um, it's a joy and an honor. I just want to thank the pastoral team for just allowing me to share and be here this weekend for the Parenting Summit. Um, one disclaimer, um, for those of you who would self-righteously judge me, the Tesla in that video is not mine. So if you're thinking, <laughs> is that his Tesla? It's not mine. They don't pay me enough at the church to buy a Tesla at this point. So I think the other thing that would be appropriate to say, I think, is go Tigers go, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. I figured a lot of you would be coming to this service because, uh, you know, the game went late and eating good food and all that. So uh, anyway, glad to be with you this morning. As I've traveled the country for the last 15 years, I've spent a lot of different time in different churches and different denominations and different cultures. And uh, the one thing I can say, the common thread through all those uh, times is really just the fact that I feel at home every time I either get on a stage or I sit out there, I feel at home. And uh, so I'm just glad to be with my brothers and my sisters, just like the 
uh, guy sang a little bit ago, Danny, I think his name is, sang. Um, so anyway, just glad to be here again. My name is Jonathan Pitts, and I'm executive pastor at Church of the City. We are five churches in Tennessee, all in the Nashville area, and then two in New York City, um, living in the way of Jesus for the renewal of the city. And our hope is that, you know, us as believers, we as believers are renewing our cities day by day, moment by moment, decision by decision. And so I've been doing that for the last 15 months, but um, prior to doing that, I was 14 years in Dallas. I worked for a guy named Tony Evans, and my wife and I raised our girls in Dallas for the majority of their lives so far. But I worked for Tony Evans, who many of you know through his radio broadcasts or through Promise Keepers or through his writings. Um, he's been a spiritual mentor and a dad to me for a long time. He actually has a Bible commentary and a study Bible, first African-American in history to come out with a study Bible. So that actually comes out next week. So anyway, really proud of him and Glad to be associated with that family. I managed his son, Anthony Jr., for about seven years prior to that. And so I grew up in this Evans brand of ministry for 14 years, but really uh, the most special Evans I ever knew, and the one that was my first ministry, and the most important was my wife, Winter Danielle Evans. She was Winter Danielle Pitts once I married her, but she was Winter Danielle Evans before that, Tony Evans' niece. And uh, she's a special girl. Um, I wish maybe some of you might have known her in the past. She spoke kind of around the country and and wrote, but... um, I wasn't looking for love when I met her, but love was looking for me. And it turns out that Winter had a plan for me and God had a plan for me. And it actually worked out. Winter, we were at college at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and uh, she was a really good stalker. So I, I, got, her, I got her number one, uh, one night at a party that we were at together. I'd never met her before. But I never called because so I was a little bit afraid to call her. I, was, I wasn't like this, you know, really hip guy. So anyway... Um, she stalked me on campus, and one day she walked up to me because we had classes that were adjacent to each other. That hers ended when mine started. And she just stopped me, and she said, why haven't you called me yet? And I was like, I don't know, you know. So the rest is history. But um, when I met Winter, I, I remember actually once we started dating, we were about 21 years old. And uh, just a few months before we were to be engaged, um, she told me, we're sitting on the stoop of her apartment steps, and she said, I want to write a book. She was a bit of a dreamer and had all kinds of dreams in her mind. And... Um, me being the self-righteous guy that I was, because I was a bit self-righteous growing up, I said, well, what do you want to write a book about? Write a book about what? And she simply replied, I don't know. You know she had no idea. And me being the self-righteous guy that I was replied, well, you might want to figure that out. And uh, she ignored my righteous wisdom or self-righteous wisdom, and she simply carried on with life full of confidence, and um, she waited for God to reveal his plan in her life. She wasn't hard-pressed to figure it out. She was a really patient girl, and... Um, just trusted God for big things. And she simply took God at his word where in, uh, like in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says to the church at Philippi that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Winter wasn't a perfect girl, but um, she was a girl that grew in her walk with Jesus over her entire life. She trusted God to complete the work in her life, and she trusted that he had a very big purpose here for here on earth. I always thought, like, she has these big dreams, and I didn't dream real big. If God just gave me something small, I was happy, but she dreamed big, and God fulfilled that work in her life. I'm confident of it. You know, in preparing for my time with you guys today, um, I watched Pastor Smith teaching on the series one and um, the book of Ephesians. Oh, what a beautiful series. And I love in the beginning how he broke it down in two different sections, Um, chapters one through three really being about the theology of oneness and the theology of unity. And theology is a great thing it's the backbone of our why as believers. It's what we use to defend our positions when we don't know why, why to defend our positions. And it's what we come back to. It's our centering. It's all we have in times when we don't know where to go. The theology of oneness in Jesus Christ says that you and I are one, that we, the body of Christ, are one. And that believers across all cultures, across all denominations, and across all boundaries, and across all um, generations and even times are one in Christ. We are working together, like that last song said, whether we know it or not, executing God's plan in history and making him known and making his fame preeminent. Chapters 4 through 6 goes on to talk about just the practicality of what it looks like to be one. It's answering the question, what does it look like? Well, today I just want to spend a few minutes with you. In chapter 5, I love how chapter 6 goes on to talk about spiritual darkness and how we are to relate to God in the spiritual darkness and what we are to do in the darkness that all, is all around us, that surrounds us in cities like Nashville and cities like Memphis and this world or wherever we're at in this world. And um, I want to read a few verses in chapter 5 which talk about how, to, how, to, how, to, how we get to that place of uh, walking, walking in that darkness. And I want to read a few verses, but I really want to just share my story with you today in a few minutes 
I don't want to talk about theology because your pastor's done that. And I don't even want to give tips or guidelines because you guys can read those in the scriptures that you go to. I just want to share a modern day example through my life of how that works. And just to let you know before I even read the scripture, um, my life has been far from imperfect, but my imperfect life has been met by a perfect God who's been gracious. And so I sit here on this stage fully in my imperfections, reliant on a, on a gracious God. Paul speaks to the church at Ephesus and he writes in um, chapter 5, verse 8 through 15, for you were once darkness in the Lord, I'm sorry, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as uh, unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, for the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, winter's passing uh, is single-handedly the most difficult thing I've ever walked through in my life. You know, the day that she died, I lost my best friend and I lost my lover. And I lost a ministry partner because Winter and I did ministry together. Um, but my girls, even more important than me, my girls lost their mom. My oldest daughter at the time was 14 and she felt like she was losing her best friend as well. And the world lost a giant in the faith. Winter was a hero in the faith to me. But the lo losing Winter was a difficult and even sobering moment for me. It's been an incredibly eye-opening time these last 15 months. In my darkest moments, I've seen Christ shine the brightest in my life. In the ever-present darkness, God has been a light just shining on my situation and my family. And in my darkest moments, God's purposes for Winter's life and for mine seem more clear. I look back at her life and I see what she's done. Acts 13.36 says that David served the purposes of God for his generation and then he fell asleep. I'm fully confident that just like David, Winter served the purposes of God for her generation before falling asleep. And that's the confidence I have each day that I wake up. And my purposes seem more clear and more clear than ever as well, even though it's been really difficult, obviously. Which leads me to two simple biblical truths that I want you to grab onto today. The first is that we are light. The second is that we have incredible purpose in this world, though most of our days can feel purposeless, if we're honest, and feel like monotonous and feel routine and almost feel like Groundhog's Day, just one day after the other, just circles around and we don't understand what's happening. But we are light. And you are light. I am light. You know, R is a really simple word, the word R. We use it all the time, just nonstop. But it's a word that simply, simply means equal to. So that in Christ Jesus, you are equal to light. You don't bring light. You don't make light. You are equal to light. God's light is in you. Just a few months after Winter told me that she wanted to write a book, we got engaged, and just a year after that, we got married. And on June 27, 2003, we tied the knot, and I married the most beautiful girl I'd ever met. And we started our journey together. But we find out really soon that um, my life, our life, our marriage was no different than most of yours. It's really difficult. You know, I remember our uh, honeymoon in Puerto Vallarta. I remember the water being really brown. I'm like, why is the water brown? I thought all the water in Mexico was blue. And that was actually a cool description of uh, how I felt like our honeymoon started because where I wanted to uh, be really scheduled and go horseback riding and jet skiing and do all these different activities because I'm a scheduled guy, Winter wanted to just take naps for seven days. And I'm like, what? This is, what we this is not what I thought we were doing on our honeymoon. And uh, we were just really different. And that was my first indication that marriage would be really hard. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even make that to laugh, but it's kind of funny to think that. You know, Winter and I were opposites, and uh, we were both really stubborn, and neither of us were short on opinions. But we were committed to God, and we were committed to living from a perspective of oneness. Oneness with God and hope for unity with each other and oneness with each other. Our prayer was simple. We prayed that God would take our individual me, our different personalities, our different interests, and our different dreams, and that God would merge that together to create a we. I think about uh, Winter's dream. She actually wanted to be a barista in Italy. Like she literally was going to graduate from college, go to Italy and serve coffee. And that was like her big dream. And write a book. I don't know if she was going to write a book about coffee or what. But, um, and I, I kind of wrecked that dream for her when she married me. But uh, anyway, it, it turns out that we'd be wrestling that idea of becoming that, those two different me's and creating a we. We'd be wrestling that to the ground for 15 years and 27 days. 
You know, in many ways we were fighting for oneness, but in every way it was already true. On day one, God made us in heaven to be one. But every day we had a choice for intentionality or the opposite of intentionality, which is indifference. Every day we were given the opportunity to either be awake or asleep. Awake to the spirit of God inside of us or asleep, choosing to ignore the light of God and to bring, um, ignoring him bringing unity in our lives. You know, neither Winter or I were perfect, but we would choose to shine, um, God would choose to shine his light on our marriage. I've got a picture of us on top of Aspen. This was on our 14 year anniversary and I think it's 13,000 feet Aspen is. And it was just a vivid picture for me of we're doing this, like we are becoming one. That me, that me, those me's are becoming we. And I remember we were mentoring a couple, Margaret and Aaron Nance, who live in Kentucky now. They lived with us at the time. And we were mentoring them and it was just this moment of realizing God is using our marriage and as difficult as it's been, we've wrestled through and God's using us. And we were this kind of a stable relationship and a stable marriage for a lot of our friends who were going through turmoil and it was just a, a, a mountaintop experience for us. You know, but we didn't have a lot of time by ourselves because uh, less than two months into our marriage, we found ourselves pregnant with our first daughter. And our we would rapidly expand. We would find ourselves uh, having our first daughter before our first anniversary. And over the next four years, five years in total, we'd have three more girls. Uh, we'd have four kids in total. And if you're like, how the heck did you do that? We had twins as our last two. It's my girls up there. That was this summer. Alina, my oldest, is 15, and uh, she's a sophomore. Caitlin in the green jacket is 12, almost 13, in seventh grade. And then Cameron, who's with me right now down front, she's in the yellow. She's the oldest twin in fifth grade. And then Olivia, my baby, who actually was JoJo in Susical the Musical this weekend. I got to watch her uh, this weekend on Friday night. Um, she's not here because of that, but she's in the blue. But just like we did in marriage, um, Winter and I would again have to make a choice, a choice about intentionality. It was a choice between seeing our children as props to serve our needs and our purposes or seeing them as a blessing from the Lord that he had given us to steward and to shape and to call to purpose. We'd be in perfect vessels and we'd oftentimes parent from insecurity and lack of knowledge and we'd struggle with um, the differences that we had. She was from a single parent household. Her dad was a drug addict so her mom raised her by herself with her grandmom and I, I grew up in a two parent household in a Christian home. I had a lot of self-righteousness and God had to work out a lot of those differences and philosophies and get us both on the Bible. But we do all that but just like in marriage we choose the road of intentionality and we decided to practice, at, practice parenting intentionally versus choosing um, the paralyzation of imperfection or we chose intentionality over good intentions because good intentions are good, but they don't actually lead to intentionality. We chose to intentionally lean into the heart of God, and we chose to be awake as parents and to see what God was doing in the life of our children. We were committed to seeing ourselves, um, or we were committed to encouraging our girls and their kingdom purpose because we knew that God had a purpose for them. I still do. that. My, God has a purpose for my children that's much grander than anything I could ever uh, believe or even help him do. But along the road of parenting, um, Winter would become really discouraged. I'll never forget it. Um, she just was just really difficult times. You know, she's changing multiple diapers. She's breastfeeding two girls. She's um, storing milk. She's, you know, teaching our five-year-old. We had a five-year-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old, and twins that were newborns. And it was just a difficult time. And I remember her being really overwhelmed, and she'd cry in my arms a lot of nights just trying to figure out why, why, why me. I thought my life was going to be much more important than this. That's what she struggled with, feeling not important because she was mothering, which obviously we know is a very important, probably the most important task in this world. But she was overwhelmed by all that. But I remember her going into her closet, and, um, or she told me, she went into her closet, and she grabbed onto a scripture that she knew really well. Psalms 37.4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And she took a scripture that she knew, and she began internalizing that scripture. So she'd put that scripture on her wall, she'd go in her closet, she'd pray that prayer, and she decided to come fully awake to what God was doing in the thing that was the most difficult for her, which was just mothering our girls at the time and doing the family life at a, at a really difficult time. See, she couldn't see the future, but she trusted that God had a big plan, a big picture, and although she was down in the weeds of it, it was, it was, uh, she trusted that God had an amazing plan. And it's actually a long and beautiful story uh, that I don't have time to tell right now, but as Winter was doing that, one of the things that she realized is that there was a lack of resources for young girls, tween girls in, uh, uh, in, uh, specifically, girls age 7 to 12. Our oldest daughter was 7 at the time, and Winter was looking for resources that were both God-honoring but fun, and she was looking for resources that were um, teaching but also um, not too heavy. 
And she couldn't find anything. So one day she sat down and downloaded the free copy of Adobe InDesign and started playing around. And she'd go on to create a magazine called For Girls Like You. Her holy discontent would lead her to God's purposes for her life. There's actually a magazine cover I have. That's actually the, it didn't look like that in the beginning. But over um, uh, eight years of operating that ministry or seven, a little over seven years of operating that ministry, this is what it would become. And that's actually a tribute issue that we would put out after she died. And the thing that was beautiful about Winter's ministry is that everything that she did, her secret was that she did it for our girls. She didn't do it for anybody else. She did it for our girls. And God literally would use her passion for our girls and blast it out to thousands of little girls. And the first few years were a grind. Um, it, was a, by, it, was a, it was actually a quarterly magazine at that point, and there were dozens of subscribers, not even hundreds, just dozens. And they were all of our friends and our neighbors. And uh, the next few years, it began to grow, and uh, her subscriber base grew, and um, she actually had the opportunity, it would go from 100 to 200 to 300 to 500 to 700, and she had the opportunity to create, to create her first devotional called For Girls Like You. It's by the same name, her first published resource uh, by a major publisher. But her final years of life, her last five years of life, Winter would go on to turn that uh, quarterly magazine into a bi-monthly magazine while also publishing 10 books in total for tween girls, different resources for girls. But she would do all that while simultaneously giving our girls her absolute all. So she'd be moonlighting until 3 o'clock in the morning, creating the magazine, but she'd give our girls her all. She was an amazing mother. And I would join her in those efforts, and God would just give us this ministry of intentionality, and we would start calling girls to a better story, the gospel story that's this beautiful story, this beautiful story of God being really intentional and then asking us to do the same, to bring light to the world, and calling spouses to be intentional in oneness. And calling parents to intentionality and practice training and equipping and encouraging their girls in the kingdom of God. A winter would pass from death to eternal life. And uh, she did that really unexpectedly. And it was a horrible moment in my life and horrible season of my life. But I'm thankful to God that he gave me 27, uh, 15 years and 27 days with winter. That we made it 15 years. We felt like we were just getting started. But he abruptly closed a book for winter, at least here on earth. And he... Uh, turned a page and closed a chapter for me, which was a really difficult thing to walk through. But God would give me a God wink um, that I held on to like dear life at that time. At 7.45, she died, but at 3.45 on that same day, God gave me the greatest grace I think I've ever received. And that's because at 3.45 on that same day, I hit send on the final edited manuscript of a book that Winter and I wrote together on marriage. It's called Emptied, Experiencing the Fullness of a Poured Out Marriage. We poured our marriage out and we wrote that story and we were still pouring that, pouring ourselves out for each other, Philippians 2. We're pouring ourselves out and God just allowed me to turn that book in just four hours before she died, which for me was a reminder that only God decides when he opens a book and only God decides when that book closes. And uh, it was just a, it was a beautiful thing that I held on to. It was actually, um, my life has been this beautiful mess and the most public grief share you could ever have. And uh, I'm both thankful and kind of annoyed at God for giving it to me, but I'm grateful because he's using it. And um, that I can be here with you today, encouraging you and encouraging myself. But God is really kind and really intentional, even in the hard stuff. You know, Winter would leave this world, but her legacy continues through our girls and also through um, her ministry for girls like you, which has grown fourfold since she passed away. But in the darkest, it's been the darkest and hardest 16 months of my life in many ways, but it's also been eye-opening and life-giving in others. And my confidence in the fact that God has a purpose and a will for my life and for yours is at an all-time high. And I'm as awake to the fact that God wants to shine through my life as ever before. I'm keenly aware uh, that his light is shining and that I am a light in a dark world. And that you, believer in Jesus Christ, are a light in this dark world as well. Winter and I were united, and we were one, and our family was united. We were a well-oiled machine. I'm grateful that we were, and God literally broke that in a moment uh, for a season. But what I'm thankful for today, many of you uh, in this room aren't married. Maybe you don't have kids. Maybe you've been praying for that for years, and you're like, God, why haven't you given me that? But what I'm thankful for for today is that God is creating a oneness and a unity in the body of Christ, which is far greater than any marriage or any nuclear family could ever live up to. You know, marriage is a good thing and family is a good thing as well, but neither are ultimate things. You know, you look at the video that I was in and you watch that church surround me and just come around our family. They've literally become a family to us, doing things like moving all of the rest of our furniture in, unpacking my furniture, um, serving us meals, 
that they painted, they did a home makeover on all of my girls' bedrooms to get them exactly like my wife would want them for my girls. And they've been amazing. But there's also another thing that you didn't see in the video and a oneness that God created uh, in my family that was right in front of me all the time. I just never saw it. And that's um, the fact that my sister, Carmen, 42 years old, never been married, never had kids, praying for family, on the day of my wife's funeral would walk up to me and just say, hey, if you need me, I'll be there. If you need me, I'll be there. Which meant a lot because Carmen lived in New Jersey. I lived in Dallas and had moved to Nashville. And she lived in New Jersey, had a job and had a life and friends. And Carmen made that statement. And I actually kind of just, you know, just blew it off to a certain degree and just thought, I'll be all right. And then I got to Nashville or got to Franklin and I cooked a chicken. It was about two weeks in and I burned the chicken. And my girls just started laughing at me. And I was actually really frustrated because I'm like, I can do this. I'm, I'm kind of a roll-up-my-sleeves kind of guy. I can get through this. And I couldn't get through this. And so I called Carmen. I said, hey, is the offer still on the table? And Carmen said, yeah. And three weeks later, Carmen Pitts was sitting in my living room. She had broke her lease on her house. She had sold her car because we didn't need it. And uh, she had undone everything in her life to come live with my girls and I. And over the last 16 months... 15 months, I guess, and she's been with us. 14, actually. I keep lying. Sorry. 14 months. Her voice and her heart and her sheer bandwidth in the most practical of ways, like picking my girls up from school or cooking or what I need most, which is just giving me advice on the most difficult evenings where I don't know how to answer one of my girls or I don't know how to even, you know, discipline them or work through a scenario. She's just been there for me. And she has been a grace from heaven that only heaven could produce. And she's literally saved my life. Her being awake in the moment when God was wanting to use her life specifically has led to the absolute rescue of four broken girls and a broken dad. And will never be the same because of her life and her sacrifice. They've made her, incredible, her incredibly bright in the kingdom of God. And Christ is shining on her. She is making Jesus famous. And she's making Christ preeminent. Carmen's become my hero, and um, there's actually a picture, I think, I don't know if they've thrown it up yet, but uh, just this picture of us at Easter at church where I realized for the first time that Carmen had become a part of our family. My girls used to call her Aunt Cece, but I realized that they had just started referring to her affectionately as just Cece, so now we all just call her Cece. And Carmen radiates the love of God, and there are so many that are the beneficiary because she's chose to shine God's light through her simple obedience to live in the light and to be awake to the things of God. And I'm incredibly grateful for her. As I think about Carmen, I can't help but think about all the other people out there, you guys out there and myself, who wake up most mornings wondering, what is God doing? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Or maybe we don't even think about God. Maybe there's some of us here today that don't think about God or what he's doing or we've not thought much about it or we don't know how to, how to be, begin thinking about those things. There are two types of ideas of falling asleep in the scripture. The first is that of being completely blind to the God of the universe and what he's doing. And the second is knowing the God of the universe, knowing Jesus Christ, and having kind of taken a nap where you're not fully alive to what he's doing. And I just want to encourage you in this room because you're probably in one of those two categories, either asleep to who God is, and if you are, I would encourage you just to keep pressing in, keep showing up, Keep looking into his word. Keep seeking him because the Bible says if you seek him, you will find him because he's not that far from you. So if you're seeking him, keep looking. But if you're in this room and you're like me where you wake up most mornings and you just wonder, like, is there purpose? Is there meaning? It feels like Groundhog's Day. I just want to encourage you that the very light that God wants you to be is probably just on the other side of the nap that you're taking in whatever area of your life you might be napping, because most of us are awake in some ways and asleep in one way, in some ways. So my, cur- my encouragement to you today is just to wake up fully to what God is doing, to see that he is just working incredibly in this world and in this city and in this church, and he's just waiting for your simple obedience. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to share, God, and I pray that my story, that my words... And that you working in the good and the bad and the ugly in my life has made beauty. And Lord, I pray that you would make much beauty in this congregation, God, as we all seek to obey you and live as light in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.
You can meet Jonathan and Cameron in the, li- uh, in the lobby. They have a few books they would love to share with you. And if you have a, a girl in your home, a preteen, or if you have a, or a grandparent of a preteen, I highly recommend for girls like you, we're going to get two subscriptions for my preteen girls because this is such an important resource as we try and encourage the younger generation. Today you might be here and you feel like a winter pits in the weeds, wondering when God is going to fully form that big dream that is pressing on your heart. If you're there, be light. Today you might be like Carmen Pitts and God is asking you to invest in one particular person behind the scenes with nobody really knowing. Be the light. Today, you might really relate with Jonathan Pitts in a really dark place. I want to encourage you. Don't go to sleep. Don't take a nap. Wake up. Be the light. This is what God is calling us to be. One body, one faith, one hope, one church, one family. And as we think about those things this week, please stand for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his light shine upon you so you can reflect that light to the people around you. Have a wonderful week. See you in the lobby.